Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Giles and this is Home Theater Fanatics. And today we've got a treat for you. So we're gonna speak with one of my favorite hi-fi companies in the whole world. And the great thing about this company is that they're here in Colorado. That's right, it's Boulder Amplifiers. So we've got Steve from Boulder and I'm also gonna have Mike from Audio Architects come with me and we're gonna sit down and talk so we can tell you all about what Boulder does and what kind of no compromise products that they have that you might be interested in. So let's go ahead and jump right in and see what Boulder's got to say. Welcome to Hi-Fi Fanatics. My name's Mike with Audio Architects, and I have my co-host today, Giles, from Home Theater Fanatics. Hi, Giles. How are you today? Hey, man. I am doing well. And as I always say, I couldn't be better because I know a cool guest today. I, I lined up a real good one today. So uh -huh. uh, I want to welcome uh, the hu a huge, huge welcome to our neighbor, Steve from Boulder Amplifiers. Hi. Thanks for having us. Appreciate no problem. It, it's actually our pleasure. Um, we've been, obviously, we've known about your company for quite some time and are elated to have you on the show. Um, how are you doing? How was your thing? Thanksgiving just passed. So how was your Thanksgiving? It was a nice Thanksgiving. I unplugged, just listened to a lot of music and took it easy. So uh, now I'm paying the price, catching up a little bit, but it's all good. <laughs> oh, so good to be with you guys. It's a, probably a waterfall of emails, I'm sure. Um, so... Boulder Amplifiers, I know that it is a huge household name for the hi-fi, high-end, um, uh, you know, stream of things, but can you give us a little bit of a background on how Boulder started and kind of how it came about? I, I always love knowing the history of companies. Sure. So the company goes back um, before we were officially founded as Boulder Amplifiers, back into the early 1980s, where... Our founder uh, was involved in the broadcast and recording industry. I uh, was based in Southern California and got connected into the studio market there, uh, developed a product for the broadcast market uh, that was used in, in uh, television programming and things like that, NBC studios, lots of places would use the product that this company designed. Uh, they got into the studio market by building mic preamps, uh, really, well-regarded microphone preamplifiers that uh, today are very sought after. Places like Skywalker Sound are still using these mic preamps, and uh, Quincy Jones used them on uh, the Michael Thrill or Michael Jackson Thriller album. That's uh, cool. All kinds of things like that. The first three Van Halen albums, I think, had uh, had uh, our mic preamps used in them. So it's a big deal for me as a guitar player. And, it, the list kind of goes on and on in the studio world as to who was using these mic preamps. But we did that. We built studio uh, studio amplifier. And then uh, really our founder found that there, in going to some trade shows, saw that there's an opportunity for uh, a company that would do a no-holds-barred kind of an approach to electronic design for home audio use. And, and at that time, there really wasn't a lot of products that were... Um, no holds barred where they just took it as far as they could possibly go. And he saw that there'd be an opportunity because um, there are people that just want the very best that a company could do. So the company sort of had some core philosophies on how to do, go about doing that. But essentially um, that market was in, in some ways founded uh, by Boulder amplifiers as to what can a company do if it's not given the limitations of, uh, of a particular retail price that you're trying to hit? So, you know, the company has evolved from that. Uh, the founder brought in a team of people that he's mentored along the way. We have a lot of employees that have been here a long time. We had one employee about a week or two ago that hit his 
uh, 35th anniversary with the company. Wow. We've got plenty of people here, 15 years, 20 years. So people tend to stick around. And uh, and so it's not a, a situation where it's one person who has the vision and the and the um, and the design philosophy. It's it's a whole team of people that uh, work together to to do what we do. And over the years, you've obviously grown. You know, uh, you've scaled with with the times, and and I like the fact that you you know sought out to build the best amplifier regardless of price. You know, you you guys wanted to just get out there and build that best amplifier. Now, do you guys still um, dabble in the in the recording world? Or is that something that you guys kind of said, well, you know, let's just focus on amps? We decided that, um, you know, it's important to have focus. And if you try to play two different markets that have very different distribution and different approaches to sales in particular, uh, let alone the products themselves being very different, uh, it's very hard to serve those two masters. So we've focused on the consumer high-end market uh, and and you know really there's been a lot of shifting in the pro audio world with pro tools and with you know the, the recording studio world is completely different today as well right so we're pretty comfortable in the in the consumer world and there's lots of ways we can contribute here so that's where we're comfortable awesome Cool. So, you know, you, you mentioned design philosophy, and this is uh, something I want to get get into a little bit more deeply, right? So there's, you know, when people think design, I, I think first thing that comes to mind is probably the uh, the aesthetic of the product, right? What it, what it looks like. Um, but really, there's a philosophy that goes into the internal component design, right? So, you know, what do you want the, the gear to actually achieve? So can you talk a little bit more about how you guys go through and uh, figure out, you know, how to make something look like a bolder amplifier because when you look at an amplifier you'll absolutely know right off the bat that's bolder right i mean it, it is extremely clear and then you know from a technology point of view uh, I, I think it's a very similar kind of experience for people so how do you how do you step through that well really it comes down to uh, a philosophy that first you you have to be visually interested in the product you know we're selling electronics that are expensive and uh, it's not just about performance you know at this level it needs to look unique it needs to uh, have a high degree of build quality uh, visual appeal so with each series that we build we try to do something that's special for that particular series so our 3000 series is our cost no object uh, stuff i can talk more about that we have a 2100 series we have 11 series eight series and five series and each of these have unique things about their cosmetic design and their electronic design that we think make them special we think that anybody who buys a boulder product has an expectation that they're buying something that is sort of a destination it's the end of the road for a lot of people and they want to feel good about buying that so even our least expensive product uh, the 508 phono preamp um, is a five thousand dollar phono preamp very very high performance product and it's milled out of a single block billet of aluminum and so somebody who buys that doesn't just get uh, a metal folded box with a thick front panel on it like you see so often. <laughs> right it's it's a really holistic design and as you move through a whole lineup they're really new unique things that we do the 11 series there's kind of a topographical map that mm -hmm. is a tribute to flagstaff mountain here in boulder and one of our uh, machine shop guys had this idea. He was looking at a topo map. He was going to take a mountain biking trip. And he just sort of looked over at that topo map and an occur idea occurred to him. Hey, I could do something interesting with this on a faceplate. So he just ran with it and we all liked it. And so these ideas cosmetically, visually come from other members of the team. Everybody contributes. And, uh, and then what we try to do is figure out what, what is the market looking for? And particularly at the more entry level kind of products, we want to get feedback from the market um, as to what they're looking for in terms of features, functionality, those kinds of things. You know, with a, a power amp and a preamp at the top level, we know how to build an amp, we know how to build a preamp, we know what people want. But with streaming services and the way that people consume um, music these days um, and interact with that, and they interact with their components, it's completely different. And so we've spent a lot of time listening and uh, finding out what our customers want. And, uh, and then the way we go about the design of the product is to 
get the technology that we're trying to uh, work into a product in there and working properly, have it measured properly on the bench, sort out all the technical things before we get into any serious listening with the product. So that when we get to when we're going to do listening, we already have something that we know is working properly, that it's going to be representative of how we want the circuits to work. And then we kind of fine tune things from there by listening to them and essentially verify what we've done on the test bench. Um, and it's not at all that listening isn't important, but it's not the kind of company where there's one guy with golden ears who's listening to it and pronounces it perfect at some point, and then we go into production with it. So it's, uh, it's not something where we rely on specific audiophile components to get a certain uh, sound that we're trying to achieve. Uh, the biggest thing I can say about our philosophy is, is try to be true to the recording because we think if you're going to create a sound, you go ahead and get in the studio, grab a guitar, make music, you know, enjoy yourself. But if you're going to reproduce something that artists have already uh, recorded, I think there's a responsibility to do that faithfully to the way that they wanted it heard and not to editorialize it and change the sound. So our goal is right. to get what is on the recording which given to the listener is as clean and as dynamic and as open as possible. Cool. So, and, you know, to, to just comment on one, uh, one aspect, you know, you called out the 1100 series with the topical topographical map kind of overlay on the front. Um, whoever came up with the idea for the 800 series, I'm going to go ahead and send them out three gold stars right now, uh, because that uh, is extremely visually interesting. And uh, I've I've not played with one of those yet, uh, but uh, if the technology works half as well as it looks, <laughs> oh man, that's a winner. Well, thank you for that comment. I mean, th that one was, um, we felt a little bit of a risk because we wanted to do something unique. And again, not just put a, a thick front panel on a regular box. So we wanted to do something special. Um, the sides of that were a heat sink and you've seen the audio industry do pretty boring things with heat sinks. By, by and large, you know, I think we've done some pretty creative things over the years with heat sinks. Uh, but we wanted to do something with this that was more organic. You're dealing with a big sort of aluminum enclosure that can have a tendency to be a little cold and analytical visually. So we wanted to give something, give it some life, give it kind of a more organic look to it. And uh, Jeff Nelson, who's our founder and and chief designer and president of the company, uh, one morning just started sketching something out. And he had this idea of, of the movement of aspen trees in Colorado and sort of tied that into uh, the heat sink design. Yeah, there's, that, there, yeah. there's definitely an artistic flair um, to the aesthetic of, of your guys' products, which I, I feel is not only unique, but as Giles, I'll pull from what Giles said, if if they sound as good as they look uh, or better, then you've really made an enchanting product. Well, yeah, thanks. I mean, I think that it is important how it looks. Uh, and obviously the main thing is how it performs. But part of the look is also the, the, the ability that we've got with our own internal machine shop right here at the factory mm -hmm. in Louisville. We we machine our own chassis right in-house. So we can do some pretty unique things because our machine shop guys know how to operate these machines. They know how to push it to the limits, what things they can do. And they get real creative and we give different people in the company the ability to contribute, give ideas. Uh, it's not entirely that the, every product is designed by a committee. There needs to be a vision and we need to all at some point get on board with it and go on down the road with what we've decided makes some sense. Uh, but, but the cosmetic uh, appeal of the products certainly is a part of what people, you know, it's recognizable as a Boulder product as soon as you see it. Absolutely. Yeah. So <clears throat> there's some unique approaches you take to the internals of your amplification. Can you go a little bit deeper into that? Sure. So one of the biggest things I suppose is, is what we um, use for gain stages. So gain stages, if you're going to have an amplifier, you start with a small signal and you create a large signal to drive a, a pair of speakers out of that. And how you do that, uh, that amplification is uh, critical to the performance of, of, uh, of what your output is. So we do that through the use of discrete op amps. Um, op amps maybe at one point had a negative connotation to them because they were a little, you know, eight pin chip that wasn't very good sounding. 
and you would only put them in inexpensive uh, electronics where you're trying to hit a very low price point. But the theory of an op amp or an operational amplifier uh, is one where you can you can get extremely good performance with discrete transistors if you do it the right way yourself. So we build our own modules, and that's a big part of what we do. If you look inside many of the Boulder products, especially the, the top three series, you're going to see these modules inside there. And the modules help give it um, linearity. They give it, um, you know, a very natural sonic presentation. They're very consistent in terms of thermal characteristics. So when you take a Boulder amplifier or a preamp and you turn it on, it's going to be sounding really good right away. and You can get right into your music session. Uh, with a lot of products, they seem to take an hour to kind of warm up and really get good. Um, and then sometimes they'll kind of drop off after that. So one of the things that we do is these operational amplifiers that we custom manufacture go into enclosures that we build, aluminum enclosures. They are uh, discrete circuits that we put in there. And then we pop those materials carefully to make sure that they're very thermally sensitive or thermally um, consistent. And then we do a lot of calibration and testing and changing resistor values and everything to get them working just right and perfectly calibrated. Um, that can take, you know, 30, 40 hours to make a single uh, module when you combine all the testing time that it takes to do all that. So we have a way of doing things in the most complicated way possible. <laughs> part of what sets us apart. You know? we, we've, we're not really afraid of complex circuits. We're not af afraid of complex uh, manufacturing techniques. Uh, we have our own surface mount uh, machine here where we do the pick and place surface mount circuitry mm -hmm. that goes onto the boards, all the hand soldering, all the assembly, all the machining, all that stuff is done here. There's very few things that we don't do in-house. And we do that because uh, we can have better co quality control this way, mm -hmm. but also we can scale things depending on what's happening with the market. And, and we're not relying on somebody else fitting us into the queue. And then if there's a problem trying to get it reworked quickly, we, we just would rather do it ourselves. and. And we can, and so we do. I think that's a huge advantage to be able to make everything in house because, as you mentioned, you know, when once you're you know outsourcing, you lose a little bit of that creative control. You know, you you don't, uh, you know, there's a there's always that that wonder, like I wonder how they did it, or I wonder how they put it together. I wonder if it's going to be any good, or if it's going to be defective. At least knowing that you guys did it yourselves, uh, you know, there's. There's definitely a uh, a really nice feeling knowing that you own something that was put together with love rather than, you know, not. You know what I'm saying? To do that, you know, we do 3D modeling before we ever turn it in to build the first prototype. We already know what 3D, look at all the different sides of it, uh, figure out the internals and all that sort of thing. So we don't have to go through the number of prototype stages that a lot of companies do. Companies will mm -hmm. order up a circuit board for a prototype and then they'll have another couple of months before they can do another run. And, you know, it's a, it becomes a real long design process. And we have that significantly shortened when we can build everything in-house. Yeah, that, that vertical integration and rapid prototyping, that's uh, that's got to be really nice on the production and design front. That's cool. Um, now, let's shift gears a little bit. We kind of talked about Boulder and you know, how, how you build things and, and how that process works. Let's, let's look about, you know, the, the other side and talk about how this then makes it to the customer, right? So you guys can build it, but when a customer comes knocking, you know, what is, what is the customer experience? How do they uh, find Boulder equipment? How do they understand what's going on? Who do they talk to when they want to make a purchase? Uh, so, and I guess ultimately this comes down to, you know, how, how does Boulder sell and how does Boulder interact with, uh, with the customer base? Sure. Oh, so very commonly, I guess people will go to our website and they'll they'll look around on the website and then they'll ask us a couple questions. Maybe just where's my closest dealer? Uh, what's the price of this product? All those kinds of things, or some technical questions. So that'll come to the sales department, and Logan and I are the sales guys here, and we'll address those questions directly. We have engineers that will hop in if there's something uh, more technical that. We want to have a customer talk to one of the engineers. Maybe they're integrating a very complicated system 
with a lot of different products and some kind of control system and they want to talk to an engineer. So we're a kind of a unique company where any kind of service technical support, actually you're talking to an engineer here. You're talking to one of our technical uh, experts at the company. Um, so then what we'll do is we have uh, distribution around the world. Uh, we have dealers in, I don't know, 40 countries around the world. And each of those distributors has their own dealer network. Um, in some of the smaller uh, countries, maybe they do, they have their own showroom and they sell sometimes directly to the customers in addition to having a few dealers. In the larger markets, uh, there's many dealers. In the case of the United States, we manage that dealer network ourselves and we have you know, a, a number of very, very good dealers. We're really picky about the dealers that we put on and the distribution partners that we have because we want the customer to have a great experience. We want a customer to get a demonstration of the product that's representative of how it should perform. Mm -hmm. And we want uh, that customer to get good service and support and a proper installation. There's just a lot that goes into what a customer's expectation should be at this level of product. So that's largely how it is. Now, how do they find out about us? Well, maybe things like what we're doing today. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Yay! But, you know, that's, that is the plan. <laughs> the bigger, one of the bigger things is we are established at that top level of, of electronics manufacturers for high-end audio, but it's not a household name unless you're in the know of of two-channel home audio enthusiasts. Um, so we've got more work to do to find out how to tap into um, people that are outside of the conventional sort of audiophile market. And we're coming out with some products, we'll talk about that later, that, that are addressed specifically to that, to bring new buyers into this. But when somebody um, contacts us, they can talk to myself, they can talk to Logan, they can talk to our engineers, they can get straight up uh, honest answers. We don't like to answer a lot of questions about other manufacturers' products. We leave that to dealers and reviewers and other people, but we'll mm -hmm. talk about our products as much as anybody wants. Well, I think it's really cool that you are in so many other countries though. So that is like a global awareness of your product um, and, and that's really, really special because not too many other companies have that kind of global pull that are still in the in the boutique market. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and it's valuable to us because there's changes that are always happening around the world. One market is having some political problem or something's going on and then another market can kind of pick up the slack. So we want to be strong in, in all of the markets. We established ourselves early on very strongly in Asia, which was a good move for us. And uh, the products, you know, work uh, well in that marketplace, what, what those customers want. Uh, and then the European market is maybe a little different. What they want, there's a lot of competing products in Europe. Uh, so we have to, you know, really offer something quite special for an American product to make it into Europe and succeed. And we have had success with that. And then in the United States, the customers, you know, have larger homes in a lot of cases and can, can accommodate some of these bigger pieces. Uh, some markets, you know, that's just not uh, possible. Even in New York City, uh, you don't see a lot of huge spaces for people to have these kinds of systems. So there are people who want really high performance products that aren't absolutely you know, huge. And, uh, and so we're doing more and more to uh, build really high performance and smaller footprint as well. Yeah, and if somebody wanted to find a dealer, they can just go to your website and look that up and find someone hopefully local to them? Yeah, come to boulderamp.com. Uh, and uh, then you can uh, find a dealer by contacting us through that website. And here in Colorado, we have one dealer, uh, Soundings in uh, Denver, mm -hmm. and they're a really good dealer, and uh, we work well with them. We have dealers in most major cities, uh, but it's for us, it isn't more about the particular size of the market as to the person in that market. So we have people in smaller markets that are very passionate about what they do. They're wonderful dealers. They're great with customers. We'd rather have that guy than somebody in a big market that is uh, arrogant and not treating customers properly. So. Sure. It, it, it all comes down to that one-on-one -on -one connection with the with the customer. And I, I came from a retail background when I was younger in, in audio. And taking the time to really show someone a product, demonstrate it, uh, you know, audition it for them, it, it, that's, that's a special thing. People don't want to feel like they're being sold. You know, they, they want to feel like they're about to get an experience, which... Um, which brings me to my next point. Um, your 
your product range. So we, we talked about, you know, where to buy it, but now I kind of want to know what you have to offer, you know, and, and how that goes about it. What, what do you think? Sure. So, you know, let's start with this. We have a really wide range of products at very wide ranging price points from a $5,000 phono preamp to a quarter million dollar pair of amplifiers. So we're- I'll be by to pick up a pair of 3050s this afternoon. Just, okay. just letting you know. Okay. Well, we've got you down. <laughs> I've penciled in a firm commitment from you. G- Giles is a billionaire, so he, sure. can, he can do it. So, if I don't know, like it, I'll just give them away. <laughs> yeah, so we'll we'll have a we have a preamp in that, in that range as well, one hundred and thirty thousand dollar you know preamp as well. Um, so we don't start by figuring out what is the price. We sure. start by figuring out what are we trying to accomplish and you know what can we do. What's that what's goes back to your design cost. philosophy, right? You you build yeah. what you want to build, and then the cost is just the cost. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's right. And so we don't we don't think oh what can we get away with it is it isn't that kind of thing it's like when people come to our factory and they see what goes into building the products the way that we do it it's always an aha moment where they go now I get it now I see why it's expensive you guys are insane the way you're doing this is so over the top I mean uh, so it's hard to explain what goes into it unless you come here and we spend a couple hours walking around the factory and you guys are welcome to come and do that I hope you do that at some point we would love to do so well we, we're, we're down yeah I, we had an opportunity to check out YG acoustics um, sure. And, uh, you know, they do a lot of work in aluminum as well. So watching their manufacturer procedure, you know, that that's over the top. And I think you guys are, you know, kind of the yin to the yang there, which is yeah. super cool. And, and as, a, you know, a, a Col- Coloridian, 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 Col- it's, it's really a Coloradian. It's, Colorado. it's, uh, it's really awesome that you guys are here. I mean, it, it makes me feel you know, proud to be in Colorado because we have such high end technology companies here. It's really cool. Yeah. And there's, there's a audio hotbed here in the yeah. area. So mm-hmm. there's a bunch of companies. We use YG speakers in one of our sound rooms. We have a pair of the Haley 2.2s. Mm-hmm. Beautiful speakers. In the room where we listen to every piece of electronics that comes through here. So that's a part of what we do after exhaustive testing is, is uh, listening to it, each piece looking for any you know problems making sure it sounds the way it's supposed to all of that sort of thing so so if i was if i was a uh, brand new into your into the boulder amplifier ecosystem and i wanted to to kind of get started with maybe a preamp and an amplifier what would be your recommendation to someone that's just kind of getting getting their their feet wet you know and and, and getting into it so the, the least expensive amplifier and preamp combination that are designed to kind of work together as a pair would be the 11 series. That'd be the 1110 preamp and the 1160 or the 1161 amplifier. The 1161 amplifier is a smaller footprint. Uh, it's very, very high performance like the 1160 amplifier. Uh, mm-hmm. But there are some people that don't want to have an amplifier on the floor between their speakers or on a amplifier platform they want to fit it into you know a more modest rack or something like that uh, also the nice thing about the 1161 is it's something that somebody can take with them from the dealer and they can uh, take it home and listen to it it's under 70 pounds ups shipping weight so it can ship mm-hmm. without you know mm-hmm. A freight truck showing up with a lift gate and four big <laughs> gorillas to unload your amplifier. Um, so that's that's one part of it. Um, but that's the, that's sort of the entry level into our separates, and that's the eleven series. And you do have an integrated as well, correct? We have an integrated called the eight sixty six, which is a tremendous value. There's two versions of it: one that has analog inputs, one that has analog and digital uh, input capability, and that is a very uh, strong selling product for us. Uh, we did a lot of listening to what the market wanted and we think responded with a product with uh, the performance, the features, and the build quality that people want. Um, we really think we knocked it out of the park with that one. But we're doing more in that 800 series to bring uh, pricing down to people. So we're going to have something called the 812 very soon, which is uh, it's a DAC, it's a preamp, and it's a headphone amp all in one. And the headphone amp is not an afterthought whatsoever. It's a very uh, seriously designed headphone amplifier. Uh, got the four types of connections that I think uh, you know a lot of people would want, which is the eighth inch, the quarter inch, 
uh, the Pentagon connector, and then the mm -hmm. four pin uh, XLR type connection. So any kind of headphone connectivity you want, you would have that. Um, so that product um, will be coming out and it'll be under $9,000 US retail for okay. a product with a tremendous amount of uh, uh, performance. Uh, it'll have app control, uh, streaming capability. It's a Rune endpoint. Um, I could go on and on all of their products. So that that's one. And we're going to have a, an amplifier that matches that uh, because it is also a pre-amplifier and you could send the output of that to a pair of powered speakers or you could go to an amplifier. And so we're building a 50 watt, uh, in a, or excuse me, a 50 watt stereo amplifier in the same footprint as that 812. And that will often be sold as a pair. Uh, so the first quarter of next year, we'll be coming out with the 861 amplifier as a companion to the 812. So the, the 861 and the 812, are they going to aesthetically stack with each other? Because uh, so as we mentioned before, the 800 series um, is is really the the series visually that I that appeals to me the most. And you know I can I see the picture of your 812, and uh, the if you can stack the 861 and have that visual synergy, you know where the two pieces kind of look like one big piece almost. Right. That would be outstanding. Right. And you know honestly, the the price point that we're going to hit with the 861 and the 812 is the same price when you combine them. Uh, as an 861 fully decked out with the digital stuff. So you can do it in steps, uh, which is helpful to a lot of people. Oh, absolutely. Maybe what the best thing is to show a little bit about the 8 series, uh, and uh, I can go along and uh, t talk to you a little bit about the features and, uh, and that sort of thing when you're looking at it. So here I've pulled up a f uh, sort of a front shot of the 866 integrated. Uh, you can see those uh, Heat sinks on the side that we talked about earlier. It is a sloped front panel, which makes it easier to see and to use the display on the front, which is a touch screen. Um, there's just four buttons on the front. There's a standby button, a mute button, and the volume up and down. Um, we have a lot of flexibility to do things on the front panel, uh, input selections, menus. You can display album art when you're streaming to it. Uh, but we also designed an app that uh, has all that functionality in it as well. Mm -hmm. So we have it for Android and iOS. And uh, we did that our ourselves as opposed to uh, having, um, you know, Stream Unlimited or some other company uh, do that for us. So we ordered the straight jackets and <laughs> went ahead in and uh, did that on our own. And so that same app is, is going to be applicable to the 812 when that comes out. So that was the front panel uh, look of the 866. Here's a rear panel of the 866. That this, is so cool. Yeah, it is this, cool. Do you see the optical connector and the AES connector, uh, USB host connections for external USB drives, uh, network playback. Uh, we're big believers in ethernet network playback. It's bit perfect audio that way. Uh, and this product is a Rune endpoint, so while it does have its own internal Wi-Fi, um, it's best if you hook it up uh, to a wired network with Ethernet. You just hook yeah. it up to the router. That's going to be the best way. And then you see three pairs of balanced uh, input connectors. Uh, we've been using balanced technology from the very beginning of the company because coming from the pro audio world, you need to eliminate noise as, as wherever you can. And balanced circuitry helps do that. So our all of our products tend to be focused with uh, balanced connectivity. Giles is a huge fan of balanced connectivity. It's the only way to go. Yep. So mm -hmm. here, here we've got our new 812 uh, headphone amp DAC preamp. Um, I'll just show this area here is where the headphone connectors are. We came up with a cool uh, sort of mountainscape that is an aluminum cover that goes over those headphone jacks. Uh, we thought that maybe there's some people that will use this just as a DAC or a preamp, not as a headphone amp. So we would give them the option to cover those connectors up on the front of the unit. There's a mm -hmm. magnetic uh, uh, piece that just slips right over those connectors. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can see the connectivity on that uh, streaming USB type B connection, a couple of optical inputs, a coax RCA jack, uh, and then two pairs of analog inputs. Um, and then you can set this up to give you a fixed DAC output. Uh, you can set it up to have 
uh, the preamp enabled or disabled. You can uh, select the headphones or have it go to preamp. So you can use it in a two channel system independently of the headphone connectivity. Wow. So this, this, this is like what I mentioned earlier, a, a work of art, you know, with that heat sink. Giles, don't you think that thing is so cool looking? Yeah, like I said before, this is uh, this is not that I dislike the other gear because, like I said, you know, I'm coming for the uh, the monoblocks here pretty soon. But you know, just visually, uh, this is what I think really sets Boulder apart. I mean, when you look at this, you absolutely know that it's Boulder mm-hmm. from the very beginning. You look at this and you say, "That's that's the only company that it could be," and I like that. That's a right. statement. You guys were at RMAF uh, 2019, correct? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm fairly sure. Yeah, I did go into your uh, into your room. I was there. Actually, Giles and I were both there, mm-hmm. um, kind of doing our own thing. And uh, I, I do recall because I saw the Boulder emblem, and I'm like, oh, they're local. You know, that's you, cool. You, you see a lot of people actually, you know, just using Boulder in their own displays, right? So I they're think that's what it was too. Yeah. I think. Yeah, you see it all over the place. I mean, it, it's. Well, especially when you're when you're demonstrating high-end products uh, i mean like like steve said you know he's got yg acoustics in one of the listening rooms um that's not only supporting a local business our neighbor however that yg acoustics makes a very very attractive and and high performance product so that's also really cool you know it was pretty cool one of uh one of the companies that came to the rocky mountain audio show was a company from europe that had a streaming uh device and they wanted to put together this Colorado system. So they they got something from Air Acoustics. They got something from us. They got something from YG and did a system there. And we're very lucky here in Colorado to have the Rocky Mountain Audio Festival, which God willing will be occurring in October of, of 20. Oh, I hope so. Oh, yeah. So uh, we're just really lucky. It's such a great show and has such a good vibe to it. We're, we're definitely going to be there. You know, and as a total aside and segue, um, one of my goals, and I don't know when I'll actually get around to doing this, is to build an all Colorado two channel system, just like that company. That is a really cool idea. But that I mean, just cool just idea. all col- all Colorado based technology uh, for every component uh, component that can possibly put in there. Yeah, I think that's super cool. That well, is a super cool thing. We've had a few people do it, and uh, they seem to be enjoying it. They haven't <laughs> sold anything from those systems, so I think it's a good approach. All right, Steve, I want to give you a huge thank you for coming on the show. I think this was a huge learning experience because not only have Giles and I been wanting to talk to you and and learn more about Boulder, but I think you gave us a really awesome breakdown and and our audience an awesome breakdown of the company and its offerings. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. I mean, this uh, this has been a treat for me. It's really my pleasure, and we are so glad that you're interested in learning about what we do. And uh, we love to have people come and visit us at the factory, so uh, please come and do that. And uh, your listeners and viewers can uh, can call and uh, make an appointment for that to happen when that makes sense. So awesome. we'd love to have you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, and uh, we will see you guys next week. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody.